Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to CUHK Law. My name is Stephen Gallagher. I'm the Associate Dean uh, for Teaching and Learning, and I'd like to welcome you to the latest in our Greater China Legal History Seminar Series. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to have speaking to you uh, my great colleague, Professor Jun Li. Uh, Jun is uh, an assistant professor at CUHK Law. His main research and teaching interests are in competition law and, of course, aviation law. Um, Professor Lee has seven years of legal affairs experience in the airline industry. He's been advising uh, companies on issues related to company liability, government regulation and competition law matters. He's also acted as legal advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea on aviation law issues and he's regularly attended the International Civil Aviation Organization Legal Committee as a Korean delegate. Professor Lee has published on various aviation legal issues in both major air law journals and other leading journals of trade law, company law, competition law, and public international law. He's served or is serving as a consultant or expert to government and international agencies, including the European Union, Aviation Safe and Safety Agency, the International Air Transport Association, and the Hong Kong Competition Commission. He frequently presents academic and aviation industry conferences, and he regularly comments in the media on aviation law and other matters. He's been working, teaching, and researching in the field of aviation law and policy since the early 2000s, about 2004, and is one of the few international aviation law experts in Asia. Uh, please welcome uh, my colleague, Professor Jun Lee, to talk about the development of Hong Kong's aviation law after World War II. Thank you, Jun. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for a kind introduction. Um, so hello everyone, it's my pleasure, my pleasure to uh, present at this prestigious uh, Greater China Legal History Seminar. Before I embark, a um, couple of housekeeping uh, matters. So for those of you who are not too familiar with Zoom, uh, you can tailor the, the thumbnail on the right side, maybe here or there. And more importantly, I'm going to have a Q&A at the end of this presentation. So you can put your question in the chatting box, then Professor Gallagher will collect the question and then share with us. So let me just put my uh, presentation now. Okay, so um, this is how the story began. So our CUHK Law Dean, uh, Professor Luz Christian Wolf, uh, dropped by my office several months ago. And uh, he asked me if there's any topic any uh, I can present at the Great China Legal History Seminar. As you can imagine, my, my top aviation law topics are generally cutting edge rather than historical. Uh, but he said, no rush. In a way, he, uh, so I wrote down in my planner and uh, he, in a way he planted a seed in my brain. And then I ended up writing a journal article about Hong Kong's Uh, anti the lamb and next coordinating aviation developments in the Hong Kong, particularly in 1940s. So I told the dean that there is a story I can share uh, at the, the legal history seminar, and here you are. So here is what I'm going to do. Um, the Initially, I thought that um, I was going to review Hong Kong's aviation law issues in a chronological order, like each, each, each decade. But I realized um, it's better to narrowing down my focus and concentrating on certain decades. So 1940s and 1980s are uh, within my focus. And also I'll address a landmark decision in 2015. So here is structure, structure of the today's lecture uh, seminar. So after briefing you on the background, I mean the aviation law. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing most of you are not too familiar with aviation law. So I'm going to explain, uh, spend some time to, uh, to kind of warming up. Then uh, two world war, uh, first war, second one, particularly second war, how, the relation between world war and aviation. Then I will look at the Chicago Convention that was adopted at the end of second world war and how UK's position was influencing Hong Kong back then, particularly in the context of cabotage and fifth freedom of the air. You don't need to know two concepts, I'm going to explain later. 
And then I'll shift to the, the particular topic, particular incident in, in particular decade, so 1940, Miss Macau incident, uh, and then uh, competition to be a flag carrier uh, in Hong Kong in 80s and then and, and, uh, 2015. So uh, I'll conclude with some, uh, some thought. And to, throughout the seminar, the three key legal elements I want to emphasize are market access, foreign investment restriction for airline industry, and criminal jurisdiction. So um, market in aviation is uniquely defined and uniquely permitted. So I'll explain that when, why and how, and how foreign investment restriction played out, not only Hong Kong, uh, on universally. And also, uh, aviation is obviously has transboundary nature, so it creates interesting criminal jurisdiction issues. Um, but let's face it, it's a Friday lunchtime. Um, it's, I, I really hope that the, to, to make this seminar as entertaining as possible, and I'm Korean, uh, we usually go that entertaining. So let's imagine, so 1783, you're living in France, and a friend of you just told you that there is going to be a flight, there's going to be flying, but it's not a kite. So you come and see, you went there, and you saw that her balloon is actually flying. And this is record, recorded as kind of first flight, which covered two kilometers, about 10 minutes. And this big breaking news received a huge attention and later it was called by the royal family. Royal family, uh, Louis XIV, and then his family invited this aviator, the scientist, to come to the palace to show that. And what they did was, uh, this time, they put the three different animals, sheep, duck, and rooster. Uh, there's actually a reason why they include that one. What I heard is sheep is, has similar body, physical, uh, uh, the, the, the physiology with the human body, and dog is the one who can fly uh, not too far. Rooster is the one who cannot fly uh, high edge, something like that. So anyway, they, they, they put them on board and then uh, have, a, have a, the show, uh, a showcase. And then uh, similar to the previous flight, they, they landed, um, I mean, uh, 10 k, 10, uh, two kilometers, about 10 minutes. Then obviously, you, you, you know that this one, this uh, Wright Brothers, uh, very first, the control and power and sustain heavier than air. So it was the kind of really the, more, the beginning of modern aviation. Not too long after the Wright Brothers' uh, the achievement, just six years after uh, this uh, Wright Brothers' achievement, the French aviator, Louis Blériot, excuse my French pronunciation, he crossed the English Channel uh, between France and England. So again, if you think about the six year gap and then how fast aviation technology developed, then it is quite shocking. Then, welcome to England, where's the passport? Probably this is the very first aviation related legal question. So in, in reality, he forgot to bring passport. He violated, violated, violated UK immigration law. So uh, it's a new way of thinking, okay, the, 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 the port is not the only way to go to the foreign country. Train is not the only way to go to foreign country. Now, aviation. So you, you see that the, the, the big trend from 1783, uh, 1903, and then we can't, I can't just uh, ignore the Charles Lindbergh in, in 1927. So what he did is, I'm sure you know who he is. So this person, uh, American aviator, uh, he um, passed the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean uh, for the 33 hours nonstop. So what, how I started was millionaire of France. He said that anybody who can fly on from France to US or US to France nonstop, I'm giving you money. So it's about 350,000 US dollars around uh, today's currency. Many people tried. Tried a very different way. Instead. Keep it light. So if you look at this, this um, the, the picture here, uh, he even removed the window. So to, in order to put the more gas. So this is some, some people compare that his journey to the France is like 
driving a car from across the United States without the window, without the front window, because it's tainted window. So there's no front window. So one, the only way he could do is that way, you know, side window, and then follow the instruction. And I'm guessing the chair you're sitting on is much better than the chair he was sitting on uh, for 33 hours. Imagine, cold, hungry, sleep deprived, but he made it. So you see that the, the, the development now, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, I'm not going to detail, but the, I, the concept is that uh, the aviation technology, aviation aircraft technology have been developed very fast. And 50, now you see that the framework, which is quite familiar with today's aviation. And then 60s, uh, there's a competition between Boeing 707 and Comet, the British Airway. And 70s, the Queen of the Sky, Boeing 747 which is uh, most airlines are phasing out, uh, still uh, is, uh, is uh, up and running by the, some cargo airlines. And, and today, um, Airbus 380, the world's largest passenger plane. I like this picture particularly because I used to work for this airline and this is Hong Kong. So it's like symbol. So, so final slide about the aviation. The impact of aviation is, is significant as you can tell. Um, in, in, in 2018, this is number of passenger, the number of aircraft, airlines, and you see economic impact in terms of employment and the big uh, economic benefits for the society. Um, of course, this is the, the, the data in 2018. And after this year, uh, number of the airlines number, it will be, is changing actually. But we'll, we'll, maybe I can discuss a little bit about at the end of this seminar. So, in a nutshell, the global airline industry provides service to every country, and, and that it played an important role in creation of the global economy. There's no question about that. And the airline industry itself is a major economic force, but also it is impacted significantly to related industries such as tourism. And because of this impact, because of the huge impact, it created various social relations, as you can tell. So it created something like billions of in individuals, the airline, the, in, uh, the, the, the passenger, also shippers who are using your transport. And it, it, it's, it's, it, we, we were talking about millions of in, individuals who are working in the airline industry. And they were talking about thousands of airlines, also some 193 states. The reason why I put 193 states is because it's the number of the international civil aviation organization members. So of course we have, we have, there are more than 193 in the world, but the, 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 the members of the ICAO, so from now on I'm going to say ICAO, that stands for International Civil Aviation Organization, it's 193. So because of the, the various stakeholders, it creates a lot of different legal uh, relations. So we're talking about billions of contracts, uh, the contract between airlines, the agreement between states, uh, agreement, I mean, Contract between airlines sometimes are airline alliances. So it creates uh, various types of legal relations. And one thing I want to emphasize is that we need international aviation law. As you can tell, internet air transport is inherently international. It's purely um, a lot of uh, the transboundary the, the, the activity. Of course, the big country like United States, Australia, India, China, you have a domestic uh, the, the, uh, transport, which is quite significant. But for many countries like Singapore, Korea, domestic is not that, well, Singapore, there's no domestic, only domestic you, you take off from Changi, arrive in Changi. So uh, there's none. So um, international transport, it, it is uh, probably more important than the domestic in many ways. And it's uh, because it's rich, uh, it's international nature, it creates rich source of potential conflict. And various foreign elements are there. So, you know, it take a, I take a flight from, I once took a flight from Hong Kong to Seoul by uh, Thailand. The Korean took a flight from Hong Kong by Thai Airways. This is one example. There are many, many foreign elements. And uh, so you need international harmonization. So this is snapshot I'm using in my course. I, I've been, I'm teaching uh, uh, aviation law for uh, JD and LIB in CUHK law. 
And at the, at the end of the seminar one, I'm trying to um, uh, introduce this kind of snapshot. Uh, this is not uh, complete. There are more international treaties, but international aviation law treaty can be largely divided into public and private. And under the public, there are Chicago Convention. This, this, this can be a constitution, basically constitution of international aviation that deals with lots of principles of international aviation. Second branch, which I will, I will come back, is about criminal law branch. So starting with unruly passenger, dealing with hijacking and, uh, and, and sabotage. So these are the criminal law branch. And then maybe a third branch is about economic law, uh, largely international uh, air service agreement. So traffic rights uh, must be given to the airline in order to fly international flight. So the other, so the other uh, the branch, which is private international aviation law, can be divided into contract-based and tort-based. So here on the Warsaw Convention, largely dealing with contract between user, in most case passenger, with the airline. And it's been developed fast. And right now, Montreal Convention 1999 is widely accepted by most aviation powers. So uh, these days, uh, most international flights are governed by international, so Montreal Convention 1999. The other one is, is we're talking about third party liability, uh, damage on the surface. Uh, so, you know, some, some uh, part of aircraft dropped on the, on the village, watch the damage, watch the, watch the legal principle. It wasn't received much, inten much uh, attention uh, because Case is rare. You know, the thing, the thing, well, well, that not many cases are actually appeared on this area. But if you think about the drone, how drone technology will develop, it could be an important uh, principle. So when we say sources of the aviation law, uh, they, they are quite varied. So I, I mentioned that multilateral conventions are, are very important. So one I just show in the slide, and also regional agreement. EU and ASEAN and other parts of the world before agreement. One thing I want to mention here is uh, on the previous slide, air service agreements are mostly bilateral. There are more than 4,000 bilateral agreements affecting our international uh, transportation. And the national law, of course, uh, domestic law is, is important. And the domestic aviation law and international aviation law are not detached, they interact each other, they learn from each other. So uh, national law regulation are important source of aviation law. Now, obviously judicial decision, particularly in the private international aviation law. So what's the accident, what's the bodily injury, what's the, what's the compensable damage for uh, the, 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 during their flight. These are the, uh, uh, rather than treaty, the judicial landmark case, uh, uh, they, they, they provided the, um, uh, the way to solve the issues. And regulation made by private body, particularly IATA, International Air Transport Association, um, the, the sometimes how to deal with dangerous goods, uh, that, that kind of regulation made by private bodies, and, and it is understood as semi-source of aviation law. And contract between aviation, uh, so like I said, the um, airline alliance can be, uh, can be included in the contract. Right, so now, I think, uh, I hope you, kind of, you understand uh, briefly at least the background of the aviation law. What are the sources and well, how do you define the aviation law? Now I'm looking through the world war and how two world war affected aviation. So first world war started 1914 and ended 1918. So here, um, one example I can, uh, I, can, I can show, I can explain is that during the, the, the war, the war, the aviation technology marked a tremendous progress, of course. And one, um, the data I like, I, I use quite often is over the course of the war, um, the, the countries involved in this war produce more than 1,200,000 aircraft, uh, even more engines. In, in before 1914, uh, it was number, uh, it's, it's, it's 1,000 or less. So you see that how fast technology developed. And of course, there was huge military purpose. The, 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 the one who win the sky will win the, win the war. That was the, that was the sort of understanding. And now, after First World War, 
and thanks to the development, technological development, the airline starts to form, airline starts to operate. So this one, this Imperial Airways, the, the, the uh, British airline, uh, the route from England, Australia. Uh, by the way, for this uh, route map, I want to say thanks to uh, Agnes, or our librarian, because I couldn't go to the library. She copied this book, so I really thanks to Agnes. So here, um, you see that starting from London and um, arriving, final destination is Australia. But as you can tell, it didn't drop in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong was not included in the route. Arrival was 1936. It's nice that in the past they used to uh, context is about name of the aircraft so so 1936 the the imperial airways arrived in in hong kong this is the beginning of hong kong's aviation and then uh, here 1939 you see there is hong kong was included so from london to hong kong and if you look at the route map more carefully a lot of destinations are british colonies and this is important because this was the reason why United Kingdom was taking sort of protectionist view during the Chicago Conference in 1944. They were literally stopping their own territory, which doesn't need any traffic rights from foreign countries. So this is an important point. And um, in, in the, in, at that time, most of them used the sea plane rather than lay, land plane, because uh, Imperial believed that, at least in the beginning of 1930, 36, 37, land planes too dangerous so they really looked at that where we can land in the on the water it could be the lake it could be the sea so using those sea plane obviously uh, there are challenges one of one important challenge is the flying boat you know, flying board boats cannot operate at night because it was impossible to see the swells so only daytime they could operate only daytime the whole journey from Britain to Australia was about a one week. In 1939, when the, uh, the uh, Imperial started to, 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 uh, to go to Hong Kong, it was about five and a half days. Again, only daytime. But it, this is a significant uh, breakthrough. If you think about the time uh, it, take, it would take by uh, steamership. So in, in, the, in the book I read, it took 33 days to go to Hong Kong by steamer. So 33 days versus five and a half days. So it was a, it was a remarkable uh, breakthrough. Then um, Second World War, so 1939 and 1945. Um, in terms of technological development, you can't compare the First World War. Second World War, the impact of Second World War uh, is tremendously shaped, shaped maybe today's aviation. The so military conflict accelerated the development of vision technology and it became strategic weapon. And for the the countries uh, in, in, in the war uh, have made was uh, improving the size and range. I mean, size and range is everything by a craft. You know, even today, if you think about the competitors, like narrow body and wide body. Narrow body, the big competitors are Boeing 737 and Airbus 320. They are the relatively same size, which can be um, uh, calculated by number of passenger, uh, space for cargo, also range, how far you can go. So about six hour, uh, so that's about narrow body. You also look at the, the wide body. Now the modern uh, aircraft like Airbus 350 uh, and uh, Boeing 787 Dreamliner, they are providing similar size and similar range. So size and range are basically everything about the aircraft and there was huge development, improvement during the Second World War. And the, at the end of the Second World War, the um, government realized that this is important. We need something, we need a uniform approach. The United States President, then President Roosevelt brought 54 allied and neutral states to Chicago, 
who have uh, international reservation. So because uh, here only Steve and I have microphone, I'm going to ask my, my dear colleague Steve. So out of 54 allies, this is a quiz, there were three Asian states. Can you guess who, are, who they are? Thank you very much, Yoon, for putting me on the spot with this one. Um, well, I was going to say China, mm -hmm. uh, Korea. Korea, thank you for your comment. I don't think it was possible. <laughs> um, I, I'm trying to think again. Uh, Thailand? Oh, yes, yes. Okay, so what was the third oh, one? Right. I've got... uh, India. Ah, of course, sorry. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm aware. Thank you, thank you so much. So, so China, India, and Thailand were the three countries that were invited because, like I said, it was only the enemy state were excluded. So Japan was not, uh, Japan was excluded. So uh, three countries with a strong aviation power were China, India, and Thailand. Thank you, Steve. So um, now I'm going to talk about what was, was the topic, what was topic during the Chicago conference, which resulted in making Chicago Convention. Again, I said the constitution of international aviation. And then particularly, I'll discuss cabotage and the fifth freedom of the air. So this is a picture in uh, the Chicago conference, 1944. And highly successful because they ended up adopting Chicago. Each state wants to offer its citizens access to international air transport. It is really important that by joining Chicago Conference, by, Chicago, by joining Chicago Convention, states can allow the, their citizen and their company to uh, to the uh, international transport. And so there was strong reason to make um, the common denominator, so reverse, resolving baseline coordination problem. So then, um, Chicago Conference is clearly represent in landmark in development aviation law. And now a convention is still fundamental source of law in the field of international civil aviation. But there was the challenge, there was conflict, very, very serious conflict that could have failed the Chicago conference entirely. The conflict was the one between US and Europe, particularly UK, was about traffic rights. So crashing interest between US and EU uh, uh, was one on protectionism, I would call, and then the other one is free competition. So the one who was in favor of protectionism was UK. The UK position is that, you know, aviation market should not be open to everybody. It should be calculated, you should be protected as a principle. And then as exception, we can give some traffic right between the two, but it shouldn't be open to all. Why? Wait, a couple reasons is that Europe was in ruins. So it was not the right moment to open up the market. And probably most importantly, the one I mentioned that previously, UK was the empire on which the sun never set. They don't need traffic rights. I'm just going to my colony. That's it. So I don't want to be interrupted by international carrier who can steal my market. So uh, they said protectionism must stay in, in Chicago conference. And also technological aspect. UK, US were winner. They, they won the, the war. But during the war, it was different in terms of the types of aircraft that they developed. While UK focused on fighter aircraft, US um, the, the, uh, focused on the larger aircraft. So if you use the fighter aircraft for commercial aviation, you only have one passenger. So that's not possible. For US, uh, they developed industrial capacity to build a larger aircraft during the war. So you're basically transporting those soldiers to the war zone. So, and, 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 and economically, they, they managed to exit the world war uh, unharmed. So the US economy was uh, robust and they were pretty confident. Let's just uh, let the market open and we are willing to fight, we are willing to compete. Uh, so they really, uh, said that Chicago Convention must provide open competition. So these two crashing view was not resolved even the, at the end of the conference. I am probably one of very few 
who has the Chicago Conference Minute. In my office, there's a Chicago Conference Minute, which I photocopied from uh, Dr. Michael Milde, who was my mentor and who was used to work for IKO for a long time. So I, 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 during my PhD study, I actually read the minutes. And then when I was reading minutes, I realized that this, this particular issue took about 30% or 40% of debate. It was such a thing that they couldn't agree. Then there was compromise uh, was made because no compromise could be found between the two and the Chicago conference could have failed. And then the chairperson of the Canadian delegate suggests that, okay, Chicago Convention, let's not govern the granting of traffic rights in international carried by air. So it will be subject to different, two different separate treaty, which is an international transit agreement, international transfer agreement, but not in Chicago Convention. So let's finish Chicago Convention. Or you just leave it to the bilateral agreement. The reason why I'm saying they leave it to the bilateral agreement is because at the Chicago conference, they, the, the drafter made a template of bilateral air service agreement. So they already thought that this matter will be discussed by two states rather than multilateral uh, the, the convention. So deal was made. I mean, I think it's a very important point. I, 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 as uh, Steve said, I, be, I was fortunate to attend the uh, multilateral the aviation law discussion in ICAO. And I realized that it is impossible to make everyone happy. It's, it's, it's impossible. But at least it's possible to make everyone not unhappy. So I mean, kind of neutral. Okay. There's no winner, but there's no loser. Then everybody is sort of fine. So I think this is a compromise uh, suggested by Canadian delegate. So here I'm going to talk about a little bit about uh, on the some aviation context and cabotage and gift of freedom. So cabotage uh, concept was coming from maritime practice. So this is a, about transport of goods and passenger between two places in the same country by foreign operator. So for example, if Cafe wants to fly um, from uh, Seoul to Jeju, the Jeju Island is a pretty popular uh, island in, in, in Korea. That's two, two Korean cities. That's not allowed because that's cabotage. So, so cabotage itself means that it, you, you, the foreign aircraft can transport to the, the foreign uh, the, the, the city. So if Cathay can fly between Seoul and uh, the, the Jeju, uh, London to Manchester, LA to New York, that's cabotage. But normally cabotage is prohibited by domestic law and there's a misunderstanding that cabotage is prohibited in Chicago Convention. But for, for those who are familiar with aviation law, uh, even, even them, they, they sometimes misunderstood. But what Chicago Convention Article 7 does not prohibit, what they say is uh, con contracting states have a right to refuse. So it's not automatic, automatic prohibition, and country can say no. What's more problematic is if you want to, if state wants to allow cabotage, then you can't do it selectively. You need to do it, you need to open up to everybody who wants to do it. So that's kind of problematic provision even today. Uh, so that, that's cabotage. And it was discussed in the Chicago conference and obviously uh, UK who has many colony, they wanted to keep it. Prohibition into cabotage is good for me because then UK airlines and take advantage of the massive colonies. The other one is fifth freedom. So fifth freedom, um, I don't think you can get the idea by this uh, quotation. I mean, this one is coming from the, uh, the, the uh, transit agreement, but let me just explain by uh, the math. I mean, you are taking aviation law seminar. So by the end of the seminar, you should be, you should be able to explain the nine freedom of the air and so uh, let me just go step by step very quickly. The first freedom of air is about freedom of overflight. So no commercial thing is involved. So the airline home from A, you're flying over to the B and country A just allow the airline flying over your territory. The freedom of overflight, but that aircraft does not land in my country, just simply flying over my territory. That's first freedom. Second freedom, you stop at my place, 
you, you, the government allowed the foreign airline to stop at my place, but to, only for technical purpose. You can refill the, the gas oil and uh, you can do a mechanical check, but there's no traffic involved. You cannot bring passenger, you cannot land the passenger. Most airline are, are airlines are focusing on third and fourth freedom. This is about freedom that you can bring your passenger from your home country, then set down the traffic, and then on the way back, you come back. So if you're talking about UK uh, Airways Airlines, you bring a passenger, uh, you set down from to, to, to uh, France, and you pick up the passenger back home. So most passenger airlines about a combination of third and fourth. And fifth freedom is uh, stepping further. So you, from um, the, your home country, you stop then foreign country A, then you continue to go to second one. So Cafe Pacific, you, I think still fine, maybe they stop at the moment, uh, to Vancouver to New York. So you, from Hong Kong to Canada, and from Canada to United States, and it is allowed to bring the passenger from Vancouver and uh, the set down of traffic in the uh, in the U U.S. So this one, as you can tell, you may feel that opposition from Canadian carrier and U.S. carrier. They might say, "Who are you? Why are you taking?" This freedom immediately brings some political, air political opposition from the, the local carriers. And, and the fifth freedom is also historical because in the past, you need fifth freedom in order to go to long haul journey because aircraft cannot last for a few hours, five hours, six hours, and you have to stop, you get the refuel. And you better than, much better than second freedom. Second freedom, you just only get fuel. But if you can, uh, do commercial activity, airline much more prefer fifth freedom. So this one was again hotly debated in the, uh, uh, the Chicago conference and uh, the solution was no, it's previously, it, it's in principle, no, but if the airline want, you can get it by bilateral agreement. So I will not go into too much on six, seven, eight, nine, uh, but the, I think at least you know, you should know first to fifth freedom. So uh, I was, I mean, by that, I think you can understand that why Imperial Airways and uh, British Overseas Airline Corporation, the BOAC, two British airlines in the uh, in 1930s could manage to transport passenger from uh, UK uh, to Hong Kong without interruption, no competitors, because you know, it, it's cabotage and, um, and fifth freedom was not allowed. And in Hong Kong, of course, there's no airline in 1930s. So two, two airlines managed to transfer from Hong Kong, sorry, to London to Hong Kong uh, without any interruption. Right, so now I think, I will, now I will look at the particular topics in, um, in Hong Kong. So 1940s uh, start. And um, so Miss Macau. I mean, when I heard this story from my co-author now, the uh, Anfield, I, I thought, is it? He said the hijacking case, the Miss Macau. So I thought, okay, there was a beauty contest winner, Miss Macau, and she was kidnapped during during that. That was my initial thought. But it turned out no, it was the it, it referring to the, the this aircraft. It, the name or nickname of this aircraft was Miss Macau. So July 16, 1948 four armed Chinese men hijacked Miss Macau in Catalina seaplane operated by Macau Air Transport Company. So operated by Macau Air Transport Company, but leased by Cathay Pacific. So, so the aircraft was actually re registered in Hong Kong, but leased them and operated by Macau Air Transport Company. So this incident resulted in aircraft crashing in Zhejiang River Astral and killing all but one of the, the plane one of the, 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 pa the passengers who actually was one of the hijackers. And this one is, uh, is recorded as the very first hijacking of a commercial aircraft. I mean, there were, there were uh, hijacking cases previously, before the 1948, but it was about the general aviation. So uh, one you know, private jet, uh, private aircraft was, was, was 
was hijacked by the WAP. But um, for the commercial aircraft, this is recorded as the very first hijacking case. And, and for the for next few slides, I was hugely benefited by Charles Zhao. Uh, I think he is working for Hong Kong Airline. And he wrote a really interesting article in the Aviation Security International. So I really like to uh, thank him. And here is, a, as I looked it up, the South China Morning Post and the flight no return. And it, it, like, you know, I said before that the, the date of hijacking was July 16th. And look at that, the day 18th of July, two days after the incident, they still don't know what was going on. And the fact was the flight aircraft was missing, but they didn't know where even. And then the couple of background were, first of all, the rich passengers. Passengers were rich. And why? Because Hong Kong was prevented from importing gold, but Portuguese Macau was not. So lots of passengers transferring between Macau and Hong Kong were carrying gold and or carrying cash to buy the, the, the gold. So it was, of course, I mean, you, from today's perspective, you can see that um, it's all first class passenger. And first of all, you know, the fact that you can, you can take airplane in 1940 already means that you are rich. And then particularly Hong Kong and Macau context, the, the gold played a really important role. So the loss of aircraft wasn't immediately realized when the plane didn't arrive and scheduled in Kai Tak. So from Kai Tak side, they're waiting for the aircraft, which didn't arrive, and what was going on? Next day, then, and then communication technology was very premature, of course, using MOS or something like that. So it didn't, they couldn't realize where. And later, uh, the one survivor was found, uh, Mr. Wong Yu, uh, by the fisherman. And the unconscious survivor, Wong Yu, had been brought ashore by two fishermen. Then later, the wreck of plane was found, 16. Uh, kilometer northeast of Macau. And this is, is the wreckage of the, the, uh, the aircraft. Then interesting development was found. After completing the salvage work, the aircraft was sent to the police. I mean, nowadays there's a separate aircraft accident investigation board. So each country, including Hong Kong recently, uh, now, you now have um, the, the accident investigation uh, body. So they are very, skillful and they can they could find the reason but of course back then there was no such thing the police looked it up and then they found that the clearly visible bullet holes on the inside wall of the aircraft and two bullet cases and one on five bullet were also found and more importantly autopsy reports said that the co-pilot one passenger had been shot so it's clearly something when was going on now in the meantime, the, 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 the uh, sole survivor, Mr. Wong, some people say uh, the Wong, some people say Huang, maybe the, I don't really know, but that's the, some, some reports said uh, WNG, some people said uh, HUNG. So in this analysis, the police found that his explanation is too problematic. It's not, in, it's not consistent. And what was uh, strange was, all deceased passengers were wealthy family, except three Chinese men, surname Zhao, and him. And three, three, three Chinese men, I mean Zhao, and uh, not only their background were unknown, but also no one claimed their bodies. So police thought this is strange. And um, they put the false information in the media, and the newspaper in Macau, saying that we need to compensate. We need a, some a family member to get a compensation. Then the cousin of Zhao Ringling, one of the three Zhao's, contacted the police and told that those four, three Zhao's and Wang, stayed at her place together one night before the flight. And then it was a bit strange that they were only carrying one small suitcase. And the, he also, she also explained that, that this um, the Zhao Ringling was a former fighter jet from China. So he, he was able to fly. But, but we did, with this uh, information, still Wang Yu did not reveal any further information. So we are, I think we are in the middle of the seminar. I, I think we need some um, acting. I prepared a newspaper. So here, this is what happened. So police 
then change their strategy, then arranging for a man uh, to come to the yard, ward, pretending to visit his injured uh, relative. And uh, after seeing, oh, An Chu Huang, I haven't seen you for a long time. Then he took, took up the, the newspaper. I was reading the newspaper, and he said that Zhao Ringming, Zhao Sanchai, Zhao Changguang were rescued by the British warship and they are brought to Hong Kong. And they said, you are the boss and you kill the passenger, you kill the co -pilot. Then um, the, the, uh, the report uh, in the newspaper, now everyone know you are the, the, the leader of hijacking. Then immediately Huang replied, no, it's not true. Zhao Ringming was clearly proto. He knows how to plane, and if I weren't for him, why would we have chosen the route plane? I'm, I'm a nobody, I'm a worker. Uh, it, everything was uh, led by Zhao. So uh, Zhao, uh, Mr. Huang, provided police with the whole hijacking story leading to his eventual arrest. But then legal question arise here. It's about criminal jurisdiction. So at the pre-trial, I mean, the case was quite strong. Right? They, they found the, the dead bodies, they, they found the wreckage, and then uh, the, the testimony kind of. Um, but at the, the Macau court, uh, Mr. Wang first said that, oh, sorry, I was joking. I was uh, talking to the, the, uh, the force, the, the, pay, the, the visitor, and it was totally joking. And then more importantly, legal question was, Macau court suggests that the prosecution should be brought in Hong Kong rather than Macau. Why? Because plane was registered in Hong Kong and most passengers were from Hong Kong. And Macau could not sentence those who had committed crime on British aircraft, again, registered Hong Kong, in international airspace. So simply said that it didn't happen in Macau territory, Portuguese territory. So there's no, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't prosecute. On the other hand, British colonial government in Hong Kong said that, well, the incident happened over Chinese territory in which the British had no jurisdiction. You see that already conflicting view. One said international airspace, the other one said Chinese territory. I mean, I'll, I'll come back to the slide. So uh, Macau, Hong Kong, it's about 40 kilometers. Um, then the, the well, journey was 60 kilometers because we're talking about Kai Tak Airport. So um, we are guessing somewhere here. So it could be international airspace, it could be Chinese uh, the airspace. Right. Anyway, so you know, because I, I'm guessing technology was not that premature, it was not that uh, advanced, so they couldn't find where the accident would happen. So the anyway, Hong Kong said no, Macau said no, no. So because no one, no government came to prosecute him, after uh, three years, Mr. Huang Yu was released without trial, and uh, was uh, deported to China. So you know, even those uh, confirmed that and a very clear case. He just uh, was deported to China. This criminal jurisdiction issue was sorted in 1963 Tokyo Convention. So I'm going to explain. So this is, the, remember, this is uh, 19, uh, what happened in 1948. And for those of you who are not too familiar with international airspace or, or even territory air, I prepared one slide because I anticipated. So, the uh, air is subject to, to the land. I mean, the land dominates the air. So when we say the airspace, it simply means that it's, it's territorial air above land, above territorial sea. So today's perspective, when we say national airspace, it means that land is clear, you know, the land. Territorial sea is the 12 nautical mile from the baseline. 12 nautical miles, about 22 kilometers. So 22 kilometer is your territory. But this one was confirmed in 1980 by United Nations Low Velocity Convention. And about 60 was the kind of custom, inter custom international law. Uh, what is, is 12 nautical mile was the custom international law from the 1670s. But in the 40s, just three nautical mile. Three nautical mile was uh, believed to be your territory and sea. So three territory might be just six kilometers, right? So I, I'm guessing the what happened or the incident is either international sea or um, uh, Chinese airspace. So this, in any case, the the where it happened was unclear, 
and then the no one was no one wants to know how to deal with it in terms of criminal jurisdiction. So I said before, this issue was solid. This, this issue was uh, the, the, um, uh, confirmed and resolved by international law. That's Tokyo Convention 1963. Let me just get a word. So as you, can, as you know, the criminal act is it's, uh, it's, it's subject to domestic criminal law. That's the principle. If something happens in my territory, then law of the, the country will uh, apply. But the international airline fly over high seas and multiple uh, state territory. So it's sometimes not that clear. And one of the landmark case on this subject was um, United States Diego Cordova. So this passenger uh, was flying from Puerto Rico bound for New York. He was uh, intoxicated and and actually, I, for the first time, I read this case very carefully when I was preparing for uh, uh, this seminar. And it was actually funnier than I expected. I thought that this is one uh, intoxicated passenger uh, so who were, were, were became unruly passenger during the flight. But in fact, it was about passenger to passenger fight, bro. And he was, they were friends. So two friends, starting from Puerto Rico, uh, drinking rum, a lot of rum, and then they all they were on board, and then one were uh, finger pointing. Uh, you didn't bring your rum more. You didn't bring your rum more. And then those uh, accelerated and started to actually fight between two friends. And what was noticed was captain of the aircraft found that it was strange turbulence, and it was nothing to do with the weather. And then flight attendant later found that two boys, two, two men are fighting at the end of the, uh, the rally. So, um, so the Kotoi Cordoba uh, injured the, the, the flight attendant and passenger. And uh, it was brought up to the, the, uh, the Eastern District New York court. And judge said, it is clear in, in the, 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 the uh, Diego Cordoba, uh, the charge is clear, uh, it, it, there's harm and there's damage. But United States does not have a jurisdiction for that because it was it happened on the international airspace. So, but then and they call on the government, you should do something, you should do something. And United States uh, the, the brought up this issue in the ICAO. And then it turned out many states had a similar issue. So they decided to have uh, some uh, to, to work on this particular subject and the 1963. Uh, Tokyo conference was made, and the what, among others, most important aspect is criminal jurisdiction. And he said that the state of registration of the aircraft will exercise jurisdiction. So it's really it's up to the state of registration aircraft. So if cafe in, in 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 if something happened in a cafe aircraft, no matter where the aircraft is, the Hong Kong law will be applicable. Hong Kong criminal law can be applicable. So it kind of uh, solved the problem. But you may think that what about the situation where cafe was parking in the United States and the closed door on the taxi, something happened. Then in that case, uh, we call it concurrent jurisdiction. So jurisdiction doesn't need to be only one. It could be two or even three. But then, then diplomatic channel will solve the which uh, country will exercise the jurisdiction. But what was made very clear in Article 3 of Tokyo Convention is if something happened international sea, then the state of registration of aircraft will exercise their jurisdiction. So using this example in full, go back to the, uh, the Miss Macau case, then uh, the Hong Kong should have um, the, the exercise the jurisdiction. Um, but we also have, remember the on the branch, there is Tokyo Convention. And in Hague Convention 1970 is particularly uh, deals with hijacking cases. And um, because Tokyo Convention didn't really Hijacking was not a main issue. It was more about unruly behavior, who has criminal, who has criminal jurisdiction. But here, um, international community solved kind of issue because 
even 1960s and 70s, there was no consensus that hijacking is offense. I mean, from today's perspective, what, 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 what do you mean? Of course, the robbery like Miss Macau clearly the offense, but there was some political activity, political activity that the um, political activists used the hijacking for their promoting their agenda. And then there was some tendency in terms of community. Political activity, we can't just call it offense. But um, the, uh, after some patient, and they realize that we need to have uh, the specific law saying that hijacking is offense. And that's what happened in Hay Convention. And the, um, the, uh, what they did was they widened the jurisdiction. Without going too much detail, I'm going to share the story I heard from my greatest mentor. This is a picture of Chicago, the, the Hay Conference. And the key man, key man of this Chicago, sorry, the Hay Conference was Dr. Michael Milde, then who was a legal director, a legal officer at the, um, the ICAO. And later he became professor in the McGill University. And I'm very fortunate that I was the last student of him. And I, he was my greatest mentor till he passed away 2018. So what he told me is interesting to share. So in 1968, Cuba delegate, Cuban delegate, asked the meeting with ICAO Secretary General. And what they said is, we need hijacking convention. And ICAO people were a bit surprised because Cuba is normally not a victim state. It's a state, the offending state, because many Cuban national hijacked aircraft in the US and brought back to the, uh, the uh, Havana. And they asked why. One, we don't like the image of hijacking state. I don't like the Cuba is hijacking state. That, that's bad. And number two, and we, many cases we need to refuel. So we, we don't like it. So uh, please make a specific law that say hijacking is offense. So with the Cuban support, uh, you know, I could start to study, then they ended up writing, uh, adopting a convention. Right, so the last, well, point in the the uh the um forties by the way i'm i'm my the number of slides is 72 and i'm going to say exactly 72 minutes uh, we are on the right track so please uh if you remember we will uh, we will have a q a so please leave a message to us here. so competition to be a flag carrier british hong kong so this is interesting because of course cafe pacific was the very first airline uh who was formed in hong kong it was the American Australian pilot. Uh, they, they founded this cafe. And I said that the, one of the key legal elements, which I'll discuss in seminar, is a foreign investment. Remember, American Australian, they are foreigners. The foreigner uh, established airline in British Hong Kong. And they, at the beginning, there was no foreign investment restriction. So they allowed them to establish the airline. But then from 1949 around, the government started to impose ownership restriction. And with that imposition, uh, the, the, uh, the founder sold the 45 shares to uh, the Butterfield and Swire, the Swire's uh, predecessor. And data is a bit conflicting because there's no particular law which said that well, at least majority or uh, largest share. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, me and my co author are guessing that. Uh, maybe government wants at least majority share must be British. So 49% must go to British company. And um, the government actually assigned, assigned that Cafe Pacific, you fly to Southeast Asia, Hong Kong Airways, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are flying to Northeast Asia. Actually, Northeast Asia are very lucrative compared to South Asia. So Northeast Asia uh, includes China, Japan, and Korea. So uh, one year after the cafe was formed, the, uh, the Hong Kong Airways was formed. And it was uh, assigned to recruitive routes, we are guessing, because you are more British. Hong Kong Airways is much more British than Cafe Pacific. So you are my favorite son, favorite daughter, so you get a better route. So initially, they were making good profit, but uh, routes to China were lucrative, until 
the, the end of Chinese uh, uh, civil war. So uh, lots of Chinese were uh, coming to the Hong Kong for immigrants uh, at the end of Chinese civil war. But the, it was established PRC in 1949, October, flipped the competitive dynamics significantly. So the route to China literally blocked. Why? Because air service agreement, ASA means air service agreement, to mainland China was uh, not signed between the UK and PRC. At the same time, previous air service agreement between uh, the, the UK and, and China, uh, former national government, was relinquished. So there's no air service agreement. So which means that air, Hong Kong Airways cannot fly to China. So it shrank their serving just to Taipei uh, in 1950s. And at the same time, the cafe was continued to thrive in Southeast Asia market. And then later, Hong Kong Airways was acquired by Cafe Pacific. Another significant uh, final slide for Fortis is, uh, I, I think this is kind of beyond scope of a vision law. Uh, so what happened was Chinese airline, one of China, China National Aviation Cooperation, CNAC, was initially Chinese airline between the nationalist government and Pan Am uh, America, so American. So it was formed in 1945, but the, at the, uh, just before the PRC was formed, and number of planes and a lot of equipment were moved to Hong Kong uh, for security, for safety reason. And then CNAC was later nationalized by Communist Party. Then uh, the issue was to who owns asset, who owns a plane. There's a lengthy uh, legal decision. And uh, maybe this point is so another day, another topic. This is a really, really interesting, actually, from international law perspective, property law perspective. Maybe Steve can do it later. later. And, uh, but not for today. OK, so now I'm looking at 80s after drinking water. So it started with um, joint declaration, of course, the, uh, 1984. The, uh, as you know, there was a big day for Hong Kong. And in the uh, section nine of the annex, uh, they were saying that Hong Kong SAR shall maintain the status of Hong Kong as a center of international regional aviation. Actually, the background of this, I, I learned a lot from Professor Alfred, uh, Albert Chan last uh, our seminar, so it was uh, was good to attend that. And um, and this one was a little, little bit added in the Beijing law, Article 128. So it still said that Hong Kong should be the center of international regional aviation. I looked at the Hong Kong Beijing law and realized that two sectors that Beijing law explicitly mentioned that it must be centered to finance and aviation. So I mean, to me, it's, uh, knowing that the Beijing law is a mini constitution, uh, it's remarkable to say that you know, Hong Kong must be the center of aviation in the mini constitution level. So briefly, um, the, I will just explain what, are, what was included in civil aviation section in Beijing law. So uh, for the traffic between PRC and Hong Kong, it will be governed by PRC. For the traffic between Hong Kong to other, other states, it will be governed by Hong Kong, HISAR. So Hong Kong has autonomy to deal with the uh, air, air service agreement. I remember 2008, it was the year that Hong Kong and Korea signed open sky agreement. Back then I was working for Korean airline. I reviewed this, uh, the, the draft and realize that Hong Kong uh, is, is the counterparty uh, was up the, uh, attended by PRC uh, officer. So Hong Kong SAR has the power to negotiate a uh, new or old air service agreement. And um, the airline the, uh, will have, um, I mean, incorporate having the principal place business. I'm going to explain it now. Principal place business in Hong Kong prior to SAR will continue to operate. This basically means Cafe Pacific because Cafe Pacific, even after 1997, which means that it's not nationally owned, knowing that you know, it's, it's British owned, um, if you have established in Hong Kong uh, and keeping principal place business, will be able to uh, operate as it is. And lastly, uh, it's Hong Kong, it's up to Hong Kong to decide who can fly. 
result of the Hong Kong that uh, this airline company has PPB, Principal Place of Business. So here I need to explain a little more. So what's, what's uh, so important? Why they put the principal place of business? And I need to say from kind of comparative aspect, because most country, most country have the other restriction saying that substantial ownership and effective control. So let me go to the next slide and I'll come back. So this is uh, the, the uh, empirical study. And then one uh, researcher they looked at the 121 countries and they looked at the, uh, the ownership restriction in the airline industry. A vast majority of them put that at least majority, 50 plus a share must be owned by local, national. So that's actually straightforward. Ownership is straightforward. It's about number. What's not that easy is how to assess control, effective control. So most countries, they put both ownership and control. Well, control can be assessed by nationality of the chairman, CEO, membership, or board member, board, uh, but it's not that easy. So anyway, in Hong Kong, it doesn't have it. In the Beijing law, you only say incorporated Hong Kong and PPB in Hong Kong. And you can ask why PPB? And we, we, we thought why? So here's why. Well, not confirmed why, but quite a solid uh, assumption, I guess. So region objective behind the switch to PPB. So remember, before 1984, there was ownership restriction. So we don't know the which number, but there was certainly num numeric restriction. But in this uh, joint declaration, they switched to PPB. And one argument is that uh, PPB served to protect the incumbent player, Cafe Pacific. And Hong Kong then financial secretary, uh, Sir John Bramlich, was a Swire veteran, who was the former chairman. I, I don't want to say this is uh, corruption or something. I, I think it's a quite pragmatic approach. Uh, and it totally worked well, and CAFE served Hong Kong well. So uh, in order to save Hong Kong, to keep the government structure as it is, it was really a pragmatic approach to put the PPB in Beijing law. And one year after, Dragonair was formed, and I like the, um, the website that I, I got this photo yesterdaysairlines.com. So in this website, explain all the defunct airlines. So I got this photo and Dragon Air was interesting because, okay, right after the joint declaration, they thought opportunity is there in Hong Kong. So um, the Hong Kong businessman as well as Chinese state-owned enterprise, they worked together and their ambition was to break cafe monopoly in Hong Kong. And Dragon Air had its ownership under scrutiny because Hong Kong government made it very clear, we will apply PPB from 1997, not now. So you still need to apply the ownership restriction, which is a British majority. So the, they switched the, the shareholding within the group to those who had a British passport. And government uh, in the beginning, uh, the, uh, gave some um, support to um, idea of one route, one airline. So for one route, one airline must uh, be transported and um, the most lucrative route goes to CAFE. And then uh, eventually 1990, it was acquired by Swire. So very final, uh, the, the topic, subtopic now. So I'm again, I'm keeping on the track. So one, I want to talk about one case, that's a 2015 uh, JASTA Hong Kong case. So this is one media reaction right after JASTA was rejected by Hong Kong's uh, ATLA, which is an uh, air transfer licensing authority, authority. So in mid-2015, uh, uh, ATLA rejected the application by JASTA uh, because they wanted to set up the, the joint venture airline in Hong Kong. And their big goal was that, well, they have a joint venture airline in Singapore, Vietnam, uh, and Japan. So it'd be nice to have one in Hong Kong that can cover greater China. But it didn't work out. It didn't work out because the, they didn't meet the PPB restriction according to ATLA. So as I said, there's no definition. There's no definition of PPB in Beijing law. 
Uh, so in this decision, the Attila looked at the case law, US and UK case law uh, on the PPB. And they, they interpret that PPB must be interpreted in a way, a place of having nerve center, nerve center. And despite the fact that just Hong Kong, um, the share, majority share, CEO, uh, business operation are all in Hong Kong, Attila view that main decision making will come from other places, probably Australia. So uh, it won't be, Hong Kong will won't be nerve center of just Hong Kong and rejected the, uh, the application. To me, it, it sounds like interpreting effective control because principal place business has been interpreted comparatively liberally in different places, such as Singapore. Singapore has uh, uh, just Asia and corporate structure is quite similar to just Hong Kong. But uh, just Hong Kong, Asia is, uh, is, is, is working and flying. Of course, there's no legally binding nature that uh, each country should comply with the same definition of PPP, but that's one observation. Last observation uh, of this case was that, um, I, I, I quote, the international transfer rights are normally exchanged between countries on a bilateral basis, and countries are extremely reluctant to grant landing rights to foreign airlines as they have to protect the interests of their own national carriers. It's a bit, to me, it's quite strong message, strong uh, saying that government, state must protect the interests of their own national carrier. Uh, I will leave it to your judgment. So, okay, I think I have 70 minutes. So it's for the last 70 minutes, so I've looked at the uh, historical development uh, with the focus of 40s and 80s. And um, my uh, short analysis, I mean, this is different from uh, my usual presentation. In my usual presentation, I, I much more narrow down with a clear message or analysis. But this one, I thought that this is very beginning, very first presentation at Greater Legal China Story. So I, in a way, it's a bit descriptive and I to share the story with you to get some idea. So in the seminar, uh, I looked at the three key uh, legal elements, market access for investment and criminal jurisdiction. Criminal jurisdiction now sort of uh, solved. And in my view, Hong Kong has been quite liberal in the market access, but foreign investment restriction was a bit, uh, was there. It's not as liberal as market access, I would say. At the same time, I don't want to say that I don't say simplistic approach, liberalization is good, protection is bad. No, you can't do it. The policy is a neutral concept and each country has to decide depending on your priority. So it's difficult to say, I don't want to say general, generalize, but that's one observation. Hong Kong is quite clear on market access liberalization, but for the foreign investment restriction, not too much. So very final slide. Uh, of course, 2020, we are presenting a completely different picture. And uh, airline industry has been always vulnerable to external factors, but you can't compare anything with the COVID-19. Uh, at the moment, me and my colleagues are talking about having another conference, I mean, a seminar, uh, maybe next month, about the particular subject, aviation industry in COVID-19. So stay tuned. So with that, I want to say thank you. Come sign me Thank you very much, June. Uh, an excellent uh, seminar, really interesting, many different things. I've already got some questions. If people um, do have questions, though, please chat them into me and I will ask June. Uh, I was very pleased, by the way, that you described the British as pragmatic. I think we're very proud of our pragmatic history. Thank you for that. Uh, the um, one thing I, that, that, to me, and I'm, this probably shows my ignorance, um, the use of the word hijack. Uh, you know, when, when did that begin? Because why didn't they just talk about piracy with the Miss Macau case? Yeah, yeah, uh, good, good point. And it, it's different, different um, interpretations. So I, my, what I heard from the, um, um, the my mentor, Professor Milde, was piracy. Some hijacking is not always piracy, and hijacking is obviously um, media term. It's not legal term. Uh, so it, there was actually debate that 
the official name of Hague Convention, which on law procedure of uh, that's too, too jargon. It doesn't, you don't understand that means hijacking. Uh, but, well, sorry, I, I don't have a clear answer why it didn't take piracy. But what I heard is that some hijacking is not necessarily piracy. That was what I heard. Okay, thank you very much. That's my, that's my ignorance. I'm getting questions in. Some of them are quite long. If you could try and compress them because the chat function, uh, I'm afraid, makes it, uh, let, let me see if I can widen out a little bit. Um, right, okay. Is effective ownership similar uh, to PVP? So I would say that one. Effective control is narrower, narrower than at, at, at least is narrowly interpreted by many other jurisdictions compared to effective control. So effective control is more broader than PPP. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we've got one on the Cape Town Convention. Um, Hong Kong only registers interest through the company's registry, which give notice to third parties. Shouldn't Hong Kong fall in line with international pr uh, practice, like mainland China, party to the convention, using the international register for registration? Yes, um, my, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to guess that who, who, who wrote the question. <laughs> and, uh, it was my, my good friend and contributor to the book I'm, I'm editing. So I absolutely agree. And also I have to say sorry because my aviation law uh, snapshot doesn't include this important aspect, which is uh, Cape Town Convention. And, and I can't agree more that, uh, well, the, the, the person who asked the question, knows more than I do. But uh, when I followed his presentation at the conference we organized, CUHK was organized last, uh, last year, I was very convinced by his argument that there's no reason why not uh, adopt, uh, ratify the Cape Town Convention. Okay, we're getting, we're getting some more questions in. They seem to be quite specific at times like this. Um, I mean, I think they're all interesting. So we've got one just saying, I'm an aviation geek and thank you very much for a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, we've got one from a pilot who's asking about any future cooperation between Asian countries to develop an organization like the EASA, uh, mm -hmm. the European Union's Aviation Safety Agency. Do you right. think there might be something like this? Yeah, so similar things are happening in ASEAN, actually. The, the Southeast Asian countries, they are doing some of the um, joint uh, safety agency, They're developing the idea of having regional uh, the body that can oversee the safety aspect. But we need to look, we need to be realistic. Uh, even South Asia, the closed regional body uh, compared to any other part of Asia, it's far from the EU. EU is uh, it, it's, it's very exceptional in many ways. So in my view, I don't think the state will give up or compromise their, their power on the safety issue in the near future. I mean, it would be nice to have it uh, ideally, but in pragmatic way, practically, I don't think state uh, will uh, compromise that aspect as soon. There's a bit of a follow-up from that on another question as well. Do you foresee Asian countries further easing up the requirements of substantive ownership and effective control, uh, you know, along the, the EU model? So, you know, way things are happening. I mean, so I would say that the, this liberalization, relaxation of this rule are happening, not by legislative change, but by discretional or the administrative ladder, meaning uh, ownership is number. So you can't, you can't relax it. That's 51 is 51. But when you access, assess the effective control, there's huge discretion on the relevant, relevant body. So we already noticed that many cross-border joint venture across Asia was able to set up, even though their effective control question is not that clear. So for example, Air Asia, uh, Air Asia Japan, or Air Asia Thailand, uh, yes, the majority share goes to local, but minority shares are Air Asia in, 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 in the Kuala Lumpur. But it's, to me, it's not that clear, or it's difficult, it's, I'm trying to be cautious, but because I know Air Asia, uh, my friends attending this one, uh, the, if effective control has been interpreted very strict way, Air Asia, Thailand, Air Japan maybe would not be able to operate. So effective control relaxation already happened by the government uh, discretion letter. 
Thank, and we got the, uh, again, it's sort of linked. Uh, someone from the UK asking, is, P, uh, is PBP something specific to Hong Kong? Um, or do they have something similar in the UK? So the decision that Attila made, Attila adopted, was they looked at landmark cases from UK and US. But not necessarily aviation context. We just looked at the company in the context and, uh, and then uh, applied the, the North Center rules. So um, one of my commentary after this uh, decision, me and my co-author wrote a commentary. Then my, my, my uh, opinion was, it could have looked at the European law, which was including PPB in the context of aviation. So that particular regulation to me was very clear cut and uh, compared to other common law case law cases. Good, I should be saying PPB as well, not PBP, shouldn't I? Um, uh, also, one more to do with the history and the development of Hong Kong's law. You know, the inclusion in the basic law of a provision to say that Hong Kong should be the center of international regional aviation. Can you give a bit more on that? Why, why you think that was so important or why it was put in? Uh, I think, uh, okay, without knowing too much uh, context then, I, my guess was they, they noticed that both parties, uh, uh, well, like three parties, let's say, Hong Kong, the UK, and then in China, uh, view that the development that Hong Kong made in 70s were remarkable in terms of aviation. It was already a regional hub in 70s, and they wanted to keep it as, as it is or develop more. So uh, in clearly mentioning it in basic law, I think that can be a sort of goal uh, that the uh, politicians or industry can follow. But to me, it's, it's actually an interesting question because um, to be a the center, to be a center of aviation, what does it mean? Does it mean that you will have a number one airline uh, it, it will, you will be totally open to all, so as many as possible, anyone who wants to fly to Hong Kong, let them fly. Is that what you mean? So how to interpret the center for international center of the international how, that's, that's an interesting topic they need more consideration okay good a very very topical one uh what's your view on national subsidies for airlines <laughs> yeah this is a uh, one thing I, that makes me busy and actually i wrote about the airline subsidy a couple of years ago in a different context was the main region was the uh, three, three, four years ago, there was a huge debate between Middle Eastern carriers and American carrier over the airline subsidy. And my uh, analysis of, of that was, you know, there's no legally binding agreement that prohibit state aid to airline. There is state aid, uh, 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 the, the agreement on the WTO level, but excluded air services, including air services. So that's not, it, it cannot apply to our airline. Only relevant law is the EU level, but that only applies to European carriers. So it doesn't apply to other other airlines. And then how to apply the law is also problematic because you need to quantify damage. Uh, if there's, there is, so, so finding the, 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 the subsidy is one thing and then calculating injuries on other. You can't calculate the, the injury by uh, the, uh, the um, state aid. So short answer is, State is exercising their sovereignty. There's no, there's no nothing that can prevent uh, that the sovereign uh, activity. But what's clear is that it, it is creating distortion. It is creating uh, distortion on the international aviation market. Some airlines are receiving a lot of money, and uh, Singapore Airlines is a good example. Not only money from the government, but also as a large shareholder, Temasek is helping the, the uh, Singapore Airlines. And this is, you can't compare this, this support with any other airlines. So obviously it will create um, uh, level field, you know, the uh, on level field uh, the, the issue, uh, level playing field issue. Um, but but I, I really want to say that there's no legally binding agreement that prohibits such thing. Okay. Is the cabotage rule still relevant? I found that, you know, this, um, well, well, yes and no. No, because more airlines are doing airline alliances. So instead of you are going to your final destination, you work with partner airlines in, in, uh, in, in, in foreign countries. So Cafe, if you want to go to Jeju uh, from Seoul, you work with the Korean carrier. 
I, I, I heard the interesting news from uh, uh, the, the America, the, the Alaska is now promoting Singapore Airlines flying to Alaska, then continue to fly to Houston. So the logic is Singapore Airlines is a flight from uh, Singapore, Manchester, and Houston. So remember the, the second segment is fifth freedom as we study. So they're using fifth freedom from Singapore, Manchester, Houston. And they are, they are, Alaska is telling the Singapore airline, come to Alaska, Alaska, Houston. For the second segment, um, we as a, as a state government will try to persuade federal government. Uh, but uh, there is a legal problem, like I said, the Article 7 of the Chicago Convention. If you are going to open up, you need to open up to everybody. So uh, cabotage is not, it's, it's less important than the, the 40s, but still carries some weight. We got some more on the, on the present situation and the future. You, you said you and colleagues will be getting together uh, for future events to discuss the impact of the virus and, and, and everything on the airline industry. But uh, we're being asked, um, you know, what, just as a snapshot, what is the future of the airline industry in Asia and particularly things like Thai Airways and, and things like this, Thai Airlines? So I'll say this, I mean, the, the book chapter I just completed with my uh, co-author Michelle Lee. Uh, in, in the book chapter, I, I wrote that keywords are nationalism, consolidation, and rationalization. So nationalism was always in the airline industry, I mean, forever. But not just nationalism, but also nationalization. So government is trying to nationalize their, their flag carriers uh, because, I mean, at the moment, without state aid, the airline cannot survive. So there's, there's justification to get the money from the government. But government cannot do it too long. And so they are going to narrow it down, just pick one flag carrier, and then they're, they're going to put their money on it. So we will see a lot of nationalization, which is against the trend for the past 20 years was privatization. Airline has been largely privatized for the past 20 years, but maybe the trend can be reversed. That's one. Number two, consolidation. But remember, consolidation is, has a problem because cross-border consolidation is not allowed because of ownership and control restriction. So in order to allow those cross-border consolidation, maybe some government can relax those ownership and control restriction for allowing foreign investment investor in their local airlines. Okay, and I think we've got a question here where someone's looking for some investment advice because they're asking, are there any airlines that are going to leverage this situation and actually come out of it uh, a bit better than the others or, or take advantage? Uh, I think this is a time for reform, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, we, a lot of experts are, are, are saying that post COVID-19 is going to be different for, for many, many, I mean, travelers and airlines, and there are some extreme uh, measures that are taking place at the moment. Um, but at the, at, the, at the same time, I believe that there are traffic that can never be replaced. There's certain traffic that can never be replaced, even by Zoom technology or, or uh, the replacement of other things. Still, uh, I, some core demand will not go away. That, that's my uh, observation. Okay, we're, we're, we're getting some more uh, uh, questions coming in, but I think we're actually sort of at the end of time. One question said, have you got any time to explain the sixth to ninth freedoms? I'm afraid I don't think you've got the time, I'm afraid. Well, you can come to my class. <laughs> well, that's, I'm, I'm very tempted to come to your class as well now. I think it's something we should all sign up to. It sounds great, really interesting stuff. Um, hopefully my, my colleague Connie will be putting up some uh, uh, pictures very shortly of some upcoming events so we can publicize to you. Uh, but I need to say thank you very much. Uh, to my colleague, Professor June Lee, for an excellent uh, Greater China Legal History Seminar, uh, and very appropriate because it's the last in this fifth anniversary year, which has been um, a record-breaking year in many ways uh, for the seminar series. Uh, my colleague, the Dean, Professor Lutz Christian Wolf, myself, we're, we're you know, immensely uh, grateful to all of you who have supported us, all the speakers, and of course, all of you who regularly participate and sign up and have joined us and joined other events. Uh, we have a message from one of our regular uh, participants from Los Angeles as well, who gets up early in the morning uh, to listen to our events and has just said what a great seminar Professor Lee has given. So thank you all for coming along. We will be back with the Greater China Legal History Seminar Series in September. Uh, we've already got some great speakers lined up and we'll be letting you know about those as soon as possible so you can get ready.